The Kirby RPG I never released. 22 years ago, I started working on a Kirby RPG. And honestly, it was pretty robust. Almost 200 individual areas, animated enemies and characters, a complete world that I recreated based off of Kirby Super Nintendo games, and a lot more. All created by me. The thing is though, this game was never play tested by others or even shown to anyone outside of a few screenshots. I got older, time moved on, and it ultimately ceased to exist. To put things into perspective, I have backups of this game on floppy drives. Yes, those ancient black drives that held like 1.4 megabytes. That's kind of all I had. So although most of you watch this channel for Mario, Zelda, and a few different indie games, this is the story of the Kirby RPG I started that's been unfinished for 22 years. A game that has about 4-5 to five hours of gameplay spanning all over Popstar. This video is both nostalgic, sad, and exciting for me for a lot of different reasons. This isn't something I've ever shared before in this capacity. So I hope you enjoy this look at a private project of mine that spanned across my childhood. So I bet some of you didn't know I worked on a game before Zardy's Maze, eh? Yes, there came a project long before the horrific cornfield. Something I worked on for about six years, honestly. As a kid, I definitely loved Mario and Zelda games, but Kirby was actually my favorite series. You'd never be able to tell from my channel, but I probably spent most of my childhood in the 90s playing games like Kirby's Dream Course, Kirby Superstar, Dreamland 3, Avalanche, and many others. I was fascinated by games, and I wanted to start making them myself. Having absolutely zero experience and basically all skills, I needed to find something to help me and that's when I discovered RPG Maker 2000. Now, RPG Maker games were known to me because I've seen them online, and also knew that there was an RPG Maker game for Super Nintendo. However, RPG Maker 2000 offered so much customization given that you could draw your own assets and import them. A fellow named Don Miguel, honestly a name I'll never forget, did a fan translation of RPG Maker 2000 during the time which allowed English speakers to use the software. It had its quirks, but I was still fascinated. So I began drawing sprites for areas like King Dedede's castle, alongside other places for the Kirby universe. I also drew characters too, but there's a major problem with this whole ordeal, and it's going to be painfully obvious. So I had zero spreading experience, but the real kicker was that our computer took lightning damage and we couldn't afford another one. The computer itself was fine, but the computer monitor was basically super super dark due to shock damage. So dark, you could barely see things, and so dark that any color that was dark enough was perceived as black. There was barely any color tone difference between anything. And so even though I thought my stuff looked okay, it actually looked horrendous, because all the outlines had random colors in them. Think about what an image would look like if you had a solid black layer above it in Photoshop, with 95% to 98% opacity, and you have what I could see. I remember a friend asking me, wait, are these the sprites for your game? In which I proudly responded, yeah. It wouldn't be until about a year or so later that I realized how awful they looked and what they were probably getting at. That's when we got a new computer, and with a new display, my world was rocked. Things looked terrible, but they would only get better from here. Keep in mind that recovering all this stuff from the past was a chore. Trying to get files off a Windows 98 computer that doesn't have internet access, a working CD drive, and doesn't read USB? Well, yeah, it was a nightmare. The computer itself took like an hour to boot up too, and I thought it was honestly going to catch fire. I was afraid to move it from my parents' house when I made the trip out because of this. I had a backup of the early version of the game on a floppy disk, and eventually got a USB device to read it. But man, it sucked. Anyways, what you've seen here was childhood me's attempt at building a world. Some things I drew out on paper, scanned in, and then drew over in MS Paint. That's how all the enemies were done. It was all really, really rough, and the story was hot garbage. But you know what? What story isn't hot garbage as a kid? So I had a new computer, a realization that my game wasn't very good visually or in story, and then the final nail in the coffin came. RPG Maker 2003 was fan translated, and it featured a combat system where you could see your party on screen. Everything looked way better, and that's when I decided to take everything that I made and convert it over to 2003. I scrapped my story and began working on a new attempt at the game. Now that I could actually see, I could actually sprite a lot better, and the story for the current game did not make sense in any way, shape, or form. It was about a two hour game, and after playing through it, despite it being fun, I had no clue what was going to happen next. And not in a good way. I suppose we'll consider this the 2000 beta version of the RPG, which I then scrapped and completely started over. In this version of the game, your hub world was a giant spaceship, and you could go to different planets like Popstar, Hotbeat, Flora, and many others from Milky Way Wishes and Kirby Superstar. But I could do better, and I did. As for a bit of history, the online Kirby community in the 90s and early 2000s was thriving. Honestly, I don't think I've encountered something quite like it since then. 
Within this cluster of Kirby fans were many others creating games. Kirby Warriors RPG 1 and 2 were well-known ones in the space, with other notable RPG enthusiasts like Jurabi and Metawarp creating cool things as well. Perhaps at some point, I could do a deep dive into the lost Kirby community that sort of disappeared over the years, if anyone would like to watch a video on that. These creations were definitely inspirations for anyone working on projects themselves. Kind of like how popular Friday Night Funkin' mods today inspire others to create awesome things themselves. The Kirby RPG community was super, super small, but the Kirby fan RPG sphere is something that definitely motivated me. I began spriting like crazy. Each sprite improved on the last. I began learning the flow of code blocks, and I poured all my slightly lonely hours as a kid into this project. But let's fast forward and actually show off the game. I'm sure you're all curious about what it's about and what the story is. How about what areas did the game take you through? Well, I'll try my best to explain what I can remember, because honestly, I haven't seen this stuff in a very, very long time. Here we go, though. When we start off the game, we see a cutscene that covers the aftermath of Milky Way Wishes and Kirby Superstar. I was, uh, still a growing writer, so please read the in-game text with that in mind. With Nova gone, those thirsty for power began to seek out another method to obtain what they wanted. This is because Nova used to be able to grant wishes, and thus a mysterious group of armed soldiers began appearing around the galaxy. They started rounding up people for something that isn't explained at this point. Kirby is apparently on vacation, or so it seems, so no hero is present to save the day. And thus, our story starts. Our main character starts the game by seeing some sort of vision. A series of three cryptic visuals are seen, and then we come to. We appear in a cavern on an unknown planet, and our first four characters are introduced. A knight that was derived from Kirby Superstar's meta chain, or at least that's what they used to be called back then. A dragon that used dual swords and fire a warrior that used giant axes and earthen abilities, and an archer that could harness the power of the wind. I drew all these characters around 1996, and they predate my dastardly Scarecrow Zardy by quite a few years. These four were the primary party, and these four were also the same party members you had in the RPG Maker 2000 version of the game. That was eventually scrapped. At the start of the newer version of the game, they take a space shuttle to a weird planet to find crystals that were deep within a cave. These crystals were unique to only this planet, and had a special elemental makeup. And I honestly don't remember what the initial purpose was, but I can remember that the idea was that later in the game, these crystals would help you find your friends. You eventually find crystals within the cavern and split them amongst the group. You head back to your spaceship since you found what you were looking for, and the archer begins flying the ship. However, in mid-flight, there is an issue with the engine room, so our main character whose name is Derek, goes to check it out. And that's when he realizes that something is wrong, and that hopefully it isn't a cat. Turns out it isn't a cat, and it's a giant robot that destroyed the engine. Welp, that sucks. The whole crew realizes the ship is screwed, and they don't want to die from the exploding ship, nor the killer robot. So, they all get into the evacuation pods. The ship explodes in space, and each of our heroes are scattered across the galaxy. Your main character makes it a pop star, the dragon to Hot Beat, and the others to other planets. You don't know that yet though in game. Mind you, all these plants were from Milky Way Wishes world map in Kirby Superstar. I wish I had notes and more details, but as a kid, I just kept everything in my brain and didn't think to write it down. Don't do what I did. Write your thoughts down or record them if you're making a game. Anyways, the Knight Derek makes a crash landing within Wispy Woods on Popstar. He wakens in a forest, and he must figure out where he is and what happened. Side note here, everything you see is mostly made by me. RPG Maker shipped with something called a Runtime Package, or RTP, which included tile sets and other things, but ultimately, I did my best to replace these over time with full tile sets that I drew myself, minus battle backgrounds, which I'll explain why later. In fact, everything you see in this game was a one-person effort, and that's entirely why it took so long. But I digress. The knight must make his way out of Wispy Woods and survive all the enemies that lurk there. I did away with random battles since they were a drag, so I animated enemies for the map instead. But, uh, I was reworking the battle system forever ago, so I stress this. The friendly faces of Wispy Woods will straight up destroy you. I run for my life instead of taking on a Bronto Birth and Campy. Once you get out of the woods, you run through Green Greens, a countryside just south of the town you need to get to. There's a few puzzles to check out and even secrets to be found. I love the idea of rewarding players for exploration, so I created tons of secret environments all over the game. Once we make our way back north, we eventually find Cappy Town. Now, this town is borrowed from the Kirby anime, but as soon as we get there, we see a strange soldier questioning a Golden Kirby character. This is Glod, and they don't necessarily like being stopped by these goons. The soldier has a really crappy drawing of Derek that they are showing people. 
This encounter then triggers a flashback to where Derek, the knight we play as, recalls seeing these same soldiers on Mechai, which is one of Kirby Superstar's other plants. Apparently, they are scanning people to see if they have something peculiar about them, but they're pushing it as if it's for some new kind of ID card. A Smearer gets a card, and then a Dragon does, while other familiar faces like a Sword Knight, Poppy Burst Jr., and Sir Kibble wait nearby. Derek then goes up and gets a card, because why not randomly sign up with these strangers in the street? Except when they scan him, all goes wrong, and the soldiers open fire on him as he runs for his life. These dudes up top are freaking out, and this poor Sir Kibble got lit up. Anyways, back in Cappy Town, Glad has had enough of this pestering, but the soldier won't leave them alone. Eventually, the soldier draws his gun on Glad, and that's when our character steps in. Now normally, there is a fight here, but the very last changes to the game have me remaking the entire battle system from scratch, which I'll get to later. Because of that, it just skips the fight, and Glad thanks us. Derek has no idea where he is, or what planet he's even on, and he could use some rest. Glad then takes Derek up to King Dedede's castle to rest for the night, and this is about 40 minutes into the game or so. I'm kind of just summarizing stuff, but there's a decent amount to explore, and we are honestly just getting started. We talk to Glad and then eventually head to bed, but at 2am we wake up after hearing some noise upstairs. Some Waddle Dees are literally planning to kidnap Derek in his sleep, since they know he's the person the Dynamic Squadron is after. Oh yeah, that's the name of the weird group of soldiers. Honestly, in my mind as a kid, this made sense, but looking back at it now, there's a lot of plot holes. I mean, my dude has a helmet on, they haven't seen his face, but the soldiers have a sketch of him. This is peak storytelling folks, please take notes. Anyways, these Waddle Dees mention a sword in the other room, so we go and steal it. We then fight the Waddle Dees before they kill us in our sleep. After the fight, both of them run away and we head back to bed. In the morning, we go find Glad, who then tells us they are looking for their friends on Popstar, who were kidnapped by the Dynamic Squadron. They know we need a spaceship to get off the planet, which the Dynamic Squadron have, but it's unknown where the squadron base is. So Glad suggests seeking out the wisdom of an elder. This elder is Wispy within Wispy Woods. So the two team up and we make our way back down south after ransacking some houses in the town. Afterwards, we arrive in the woods, only to get jumped by the locals there. But fear not, because with Glad, we can survive this ordeal. Wispy Woods snakes around through dense forest, and after a few encounters, Derek smells a strong pollen smell, which means Flowey from Undertale must be nearby. I press on deep into the forest, and really take my time to figure out the secrets. I know that sounds silly, but honestly, I don't remember all the small details in the game. Too much time has passed. If you can't fathom how long 20 years is mentally, you probably won't understand what I mean. There's some secrets hidden behind the trees that allow us to get some treasure chests out in the middle of the pond, and a secret passage that takes us behind a bunch of trees for another. But after this, our heroes come in contact with Wispy. And for some reason, I made Wispy this all-knowing tree thing, while in the game he just frowns and throws apples at your butt. Wispy tells the characters where they can find what they're looking for. Derek finds out about a desert spaceship, and also warp stars. And Glad finds out one of their friends is being held in Marshmallow Mansion which is that level from the Dynablade arc in Kirby Superstar. Both characters get the information thereafter, but unfortunately, they are jumped by a few members of the squadron. And, uh, we get massacred. I was laughing so hard because the last time I was working on this game almost two decades ago, I was redoing the combat system and was adjusting stats. But I didn't get around to tweaking all the enemy stats because the old battle system was invalid. So it's literally my two characters standing in front of a firing squad and getting lit up. So, uh, I had to balance the stats out a bit, otherwise this would be impossible. For reference, my two characters used to have four times their current health, and almost triple their stats. But even with a nerf against the squadron, it was a difficult fight. Luckily Wispy helps you out in the battle by blowing strong gusts of winds, and by healing the party occasionally. We managed to make it out alive, despite getting thrashed. But now we must make our way out of the forest and head to Dynablades Mountain. But honestly, that's pretty far away. We have a ton of ground to cover. So we need to make it through Green Greens to Yogurt Yard first off. Yogurt Yard is basically the sprawling countryside filled with canyons, tons of plants, and bubbly clouds. And, uh, it's huge. I don't know why I made this area so huge, but you can totally get lost in it exploring all the different areas. It's also absent of confrontation too. 
as a kid when I was designing these places. I wanted to build the world first and then come back through and add the enemies. This was done in Wispy Woods, but then I ultimately decided I wanted to do my own battle system like Paper Mario, which I'll get to later. But I was obsessed with creating sprawling landscapes. I wasn't able to travel anywhere as a kid, so creating these places was sort of therapeutic in some regards. But this is really only the tip of the iceberg with Yogurt Yard. We spent about 10 minutes passing through it before we ultimately arrive at Yogurt Town. Yogurt Town is a city I created in the heart of this area. It's an underground town where a ton of different characters can be found. I had a blast creating all my favorite Kirby Superstar enemies as NPCs for the town. I also made some new characters up like the dragons that reside here and some of the knights that roam the area. The town has underground gardens, a shopping area, tons of characters of all kinds that you can talk to, a dragon who is, um, sitting on a drawer hidden on the edge of the forest area. I don't know. Being here is weird because I remember making this, but I also don't fully remember every detail. Exploring this town, and more so this surrounding area, feels like tapping into memories from a different life. I don't mean to be sentimental, but this is a time capsule I haven't opened in a very long time. All I had were the old screenshots, but getting to work in engine again was a very annoying process because everything was broken between software versions. Anyways, we're going to dip out of Yogurt Town and continue our adventure north through more Yogurt Yard because, dear lord, there's a lot of it. But as we exit, we run to another character, Dagger, who is someone Glad was looking for. Dagger is crying like a baby in the middle of Yogurt Yard and then immediately gets shocked when they see Glad. Dagger then tries to warn Glad that someone is inside the mansion up north, and together they can save this person called BC with a normal tree branch. Dagger then knocks Derek out with a stick, thinking he's a spy, and, uh, eventually, after some further conversation, Dagger joins the party. Also, I never drew Dagger's face, so their icon is a chicken. It's oddly appropriate, though. Now, I'm going to stop here for a second as I continue to wander through Yogurt Yard and add some context. The characters in this RPG are all my online friends from when I was younger. We didn't have Discord or all that jazz, but we did have MIRC, a chat room program, and we had online gaming forums. Sadly, I lost contact with some of these people as we all grew up, but some of them I'm still friends with. One of my biggest regrets as a kid was not staying in contact with my online friends. The thing is, this probably doesn't happen as often as it did back then. Social media wasn't a thing like it is now, and I lost a lot of friends. Kirby friends, RuneScape friends. Heck, when Fantasy Star Online for the GameCube closed down, I lost friends there too, and I still wonder about them. But I digress. Yogurt Yard has a lot of areas that it feeds into, one being Sand Canyon. We'll be visiting there later, but I did want to make a note of it. While wandering around Yogurt Yard, I stumble upon a secret door. This takes us to another hidden area, which is kind of cool because it's way up in the clouds. I didn't remember this area at all, but I did make some floating platforms you could go on. Figuring out how to make those was interesting. But anyways, we need to ride the platforms to up top, and then hit the switches in the order of the colored rocks from down below. Once we do, another platform spawns near the start. We can then ride this over for another treasure chest, containing a shield and another collectible metal that I ripped off from Dragon Quest. As I was saying earlier, making Yogurt Yard was therapeutic. I had my Pixel Portal series about game levels I loved as a kid, but this game was my Pixel Portal. My world I created. Going through here and listening to the MIDI remakes of the Kirby's Block Ball soundtrack kind of took me down a feels trip. And you might not care, and that's totally cool. But I'm not gonna lie, showing off this game has a bit of vulnerability to it. It makes me feel old. It makes me remember the hundreds of hours I poured into it, not knowing what my future would look like as I grew up. Heck, even graduating from high school was so far away still. It's a weird feeling. About 15 minutes later, and I've explored this place top to bottom. We finally reached the foot of Dinoblades Mountain, and we're heading further north to Marshmallow Mansion. Before we get inside though, we encounter the Waddle Dee Mafia. Playing this again, I honestly didn't even remember who these guys were. And that's weird. I made this, yet here I am not knowing who these dudes are. Apparently, they've taken over Marshmallow Mansion and are keeping one of Glad's friends inside. They are waiting on a financial advisor from the Dynamic Squadron, which doesn't make any sense to me, but heck, I wrote it, I guess. We head inside and immediately are confronted by some Mafia members. The fight was never scripted, so they all just die as we advance the conversation. I then begin to look around. Marshmallow Mansion was one of the last tile sets I made for the game, and I remember keeping Kirby Superstar running on the Super Nintendo so I could make a match. I think I did a really good job capturing the aesthetic of it. Now, at this point, I should be honest, and say that during this entire experience, I've been patching the game in real time to get it to work. The old fan translation that ran on Windows 98 and XP was kind of thrown together, so lots of stuff has been broken. I've basically solved it all to get it to run, but it has definitely been a chore. 
I need to reset the puzzle in this room because it's dependent on variables that were never set. But once I patch it up, I load back into the game. We then swap to Glad, who gives us a hint to solving the puzzle. You need to swap to Dagger and use Dagger's long tongue to reach through the fence and hit the switch. This then opens the gate in the lobby. I was experimenting with character swapping for solving puzzles, and we need to do two total character swaps here. Upstairs, we need to disguise ourselves as a dynamic squadron soldier to enter the room. Glad puts on the armor, despite the game glitching, and we head on over. One of the Mafia members mentions that an orange tile is out of place and if we check it out, we can see it actually leads to a secret ladder. I don't know what was supposed to be down here, but we need to go to the roof. Once on the roof, we can see that the leader is shocked to see us, since we are not the person they were expecting. The rest of the group joins up with Derek, and that's when they all spot the Charmander character within the fenced off area. Apparently, the Mafia leader, who later is revealed to be named Radical D, was going to hand her over to the Dynamic Squadron, but that's when a mind-controlled Kirby steps out from behind the Mafia boss. Apparently, Kirby wasn't on vacation after all. He was being controlled by the Mafia. Now, this was going to be a pretty difficult boss fight, given it's Kirby, someone who had saved the galaxy before. I believe you just had to destroy the machine on his head, but I never got around to building out the fight, so the dialogue just skips past that. Radical D is knocked out, but Kirby is just kind of gone, and I have no idea where he went. Our characters then turn their attention to Baby Char, who is a Kirby-fied Charmander from Pokemon. But before she gets rescued, two foes teleport in, and they talk and talk and talk and make all the dramatic introductions. These are the two dynamic squadron head honchos for the planet Popstar. Jaden controls the power of electricity, and the other dude, Melvin, well, he just thinks he's a pirate. They end up teleporting away to the base at the top of the mountain, so our characters need to think of a way to get up there. Mind you, I am a few hours into playing already. I did get really far into making this game, and every area was basically complete. There's three more dungeons and events to cover though, so strap in. Our heroes jump off the roof, which broke the game several times until I got to work, due to version differences. And then, we head south to the fields in front of Marshmallow Mansion, and that's where we find a warp star. I can't help but laugh because for some reason, the Naruto morning song was the mini music I chose for this scene. I guess you could tell what I watched as a kid. I won't lie and say it didn't make me tear up a bit from nostalgia. Is that something I should admit? Now that a warp star is found, Derek of course thinks he knows what he's doing and he grabs onto it. And this is a mistake. He can't figure out how to get to work, but then all of a sudden he's screaming to help him because it started to move. He shoots off into the sky, way above Glad and Dagger, and has a very hard time controlling the Warp Star. He then crash lands off screen, and we find out that he crashed right through the ceiling of the Dynamic Squadron base. Whoops. Back in the field, Glad and Dagger must now make their way up to the headquarters to save both Baby Char and Derek, and the only way up is to head inside an ice cave. This cave would normally be teeming with ice-focused enemies, but again, since development was still in the works, they were never placed. Their character sprites and animations were made though. There was quite a few different foes that Glad and Dagger could encounter. The ice cave is really a puzzle-focused dungeon, as majority of the challenges within revolve around puzzles. It's a very large cave too, and we have to wander around until we stumble upon a star door. There's a teleporting crystal in the room, hidden behind lots of ice, and when we touch it, it warps us to another part of the dungeon. We wander through another winter wonderland that normally will be full of enemies, and eventually come across a boulder-pushing puzzle. Each colored rock needs to be pushed onto the same colored switch in order to advance. This was another simple puzzle I was proud to figure out how to code as a kid. Once we get all the rocks in place, the path opens and we can move on. We then enter another room full of rocks and teleportation orbs that warp us to the start of the room. There's treasure chests scattered all around, and honestly, this room was a bit hard to figure out. I go for a few different chests, and then I end up making it to the other side. And this is where the game gets a bit fragmented, so in the beta version, or in the really, really early version of the game, this ice cave was elsewhere. But this room was the boss encounter room for the Super Ice Golem. It was the upgraded form of an ice golem. Normally, upon defeat, the path to the north would open up, but none of the story logic was in place. In fact, the last attached story aspect I ever got done was that warp star scene, which is kind of what made it sentimental, because I remember doing that and then moving on to the combat system rewrites, which I never got to work. After that, I moved on in life. But we still have a lot to cover, so we're heading north and out of the cave. We go through a snowy mountain pass as we climb higher and higher on Dinoblades Mountain. We then reach the upper part of the mountain and are once again tossed into lush wilderness. 
The Dynamic Squadron HQ is at the summit, and we make over there. Now, this place was kind of working. There were enemies I could encounter, but the map lacked overarching story elements. We get spanked by some Dynamic soldiers and barely survive the encounters. You'll notice that the text boxes are different here for talking, because I made parts of this map really early in the game's development. Enemies use face pictures here. We need to head to the west to solve the puzzle, though. But on the way, we encounter something I am really proud of. There's fake floor pieces that are traps that pop out of the ground and spray you with fire if you get too close. This is a common trap in the headquarters. Honestly, I thought these were super cool. We then reach the puzzle and must turn all the red switches to green. I think I ripped off this puzzle from Super Mario RPG, but I can't remember. We get our first key card and can move on. But it turns out I didn't even link all the maps together. So I had to quickly go in and make it so I could actually explore the whole facility. Again, I drew all this stuff in MS Paint, and I definitely want to show it off since I think it looked pretty good for a kid. With the map doorways restored, we can use our keycard to make our way through some hallways, another room with a giant crane, and to another chest that has a different keycard. This keycard grants us access to the rest of the facility. At this point in the story, we would have gone through several scripted fights and encounters, and would have eventually rescued Derek and possibly Baby Char. Or at least, I think we would have? We can access both of the offices of the squadron leaders, both Jaden's and Melvin's. And Melvin's has a pretty snazzy pirate ship, cannonballs, and giant anchors. Arg, a true pirate he be. In the closet from before was a button combination that reveals a solution to a gate puzzle. After we solve it, which is simple, we can move on. I eventually got to where Derek crashed in, and that was the end of the road for this area. I know, we would have eventually fought either Jaden or Melvin here, or at least some sort of boss encounter. I don't know if both characters were rescued just yet, though. There's hints of plans that this facility might have gotten destroyed by destroying the giant energy crystal. I think somehow your characters would have then made it onto a minecart ride of some kind. I only know this because there's a room I made called Trolley End that is near the bottom of the mountain next to the ice cave entrance. This headquarters area was definitely inspired by a few different games. Burst Man's Level from Mega Man 7, x Not Fortress and Paper Mario The Thousand Year Door, and Smithy's Factory in Super Mario RPG. The minecart ride was also probably inspired by Super Mario RPG or Kirby Superstar 2, but I never built out the tracks. However, our adventure is not over yet. We have one last place to visit, the conclusion to this trek all over Popstar. I think the idea was that after destroying the headquarters, all the ships would get destroyed too. So that means the only way to get off the planet, since Derek crashed the Warp Star, would be to head to the desert and try to find the glider hidden there. I don't know how a glider translates to a spaceship, but a giant desert cruiser that can move through space sounded pretty dope. So our party of three or four would have ran down to Sand Canyon. Now, Sand Canyon, at least from what I can remember, was the last area before the group eventually left Popstar. So the area was fairly difficult. The enemies here would have been decently tough, and overall there was a puzzle that needed to be solved. Eventually, after wandering through the desert long enough, you come across a maze of similar smaller areas. So every room or map is the same size, but they are laid out on a grid and it's confusing. This was a common thing I encountered in RPGs, and I think I yoinked the idea from games I had played. You could go up, down, left, or right, and it was very easy to get lost. However, there was one room that had six stone spikes that held blue gems. This room was important. Before getting into this area, if you wandered around and explored Sand Canyon completely, you would have come across these markings on a wall. These wall sketches showed a person holding two objects in a depiction of this room. We can then see in the bottom right corner that a spacecraft of some kind is beneath them, rising out of the desert floor. As for the rest of the mumbo jumbo on the wall, I have no idea what it means. The one tile looks like floor pieces in the Dynamic Squadron headquarters, but I don't know why I put it there. Anyways, back in the desert room that looks like a sacred place, we need those two items, but they don't exist in the game. However, I did make the areas where they would be found. The player would have to locate two star doors within the desert maze. These doors would have led to underground caverns that would have held one of the two key items needed to make the ship rise to the surface. There would have been mini bosses down there too. And that's where the trail ends, sorta, because there's a gap missing in the timeline. However, I have some art assets that sort of hinted at what would have transpired. For starters, when playing through here, I completely forgot about the second giant boss robot. Apparently, either within the headquarters or right before the player took off from Popstar, they would have fought against this horrifying thing. It was a giant robot that both Jaden and Melvin could pilot at once. 
I think the player would have battled these two generals in person at the headquarters. And then the final shebang was a Lord Crump-like battle against a giant silly robot. Each of the pods would have been able to be attacked separately, and upon defeat, the players could escape the planet. However, it was uncertain whether Baby Char, the Charmander character, was actually rescued on Popstar. She might have been rescued over on Hotbeat. At some point, our home computer contracted a virus, and while I was getting fixed, I used our old thunder damage machine with a new monitor to continue making stuff. So I created a secondary RPG Maker game to build out some of the next environments. I just never got around to porting these maps over, however. Our player's next destination was Hotbeat, to find the dragon character who was lost at the start of the game. Hoppy is this giant ball of fire, but I decided to give it a jungle environment on one of the sides of the planet we couldn't see. That's why all these dragon sprites exist. I basically was going to make the planet inhabited by reptiles, and I got a decent amount of the map created. I drew heavy inspiration from Galdeval Island from Fantasy Star Online, and other jungle environments, but I wanted to create a sense of depth. So in this jungle, you had the ability to climb vines, walk across giant tree branches, and climb on top of ancient ruins. Each of these things were separate into layers, so the player couldn't walk off them. From what I can tell, I guess the idea was to have your character navigate deeper into the jungle until you eventually came to a village. I know I planned on having a cave system, more or less jungle environments, and then the lava field similar to in Kirby Superstar. The end bosses of this planet were two dragons, Draconis and Darius. I think you had to fight a chief dragon in 1.2, but that might have been scrapped a long time ago. There were dragon thieves, and even Draugr dragons and tombs. I totally ripped off Morrowind's Blood Moon expansion for that one. But yeah, the trail ends here. There's tons of sprites, animations, and a whole lot of things that never made into the game. I set out to make a custom menu system so that when the player hit the escape key to pause the game, I basically made a map that was a custom menu. Doing all of this was a pain in the butt. It doesn't look very good visually either, but I was proud of getting all the character stats and stuff to show up. This bled into making the custom battle system that was like Paper Mario. Timed hits did more damage, and sometimes let you combo enemies. All of this took place on the map too, and didn't rely on the in-game battle system. But this took a ton of time to work on, and it wasn't scalable. I can't get any footage of the system working at the moment, but it lagged like crazy, and it was upsetting after I put all that work into it. At this point, I was older. I was frustrated, because this part of the project wasn't fun unlike everything else, and I basically dug myself into a hole. I slowly threw in the towel around 2005 or 2006 when my life was taking me in different directions. During this time, Zardi and all those characters started becoming a thing too, and they didn't rely on an existing fan base like Kirby. However, I still loved my goofy characters, and I even made clay models of them way back when. They aren't in the best shape, but they are kinda still together. But that's my RPG that no one ever saw. Going through all this again was really, really cool, and I hope you enjoyed it. I was sad that I never got to share with anyone as it was a big part of my life. But by putting this video out there on YouTube, people did get to finally experience it, just in a different way. Thanks for watching everyone, I hope you enjoyed this nostalgic trip through my old game, and until next time, cheers.